Um, thank you all for joining us today. Go ahead and t let us know in the chat where you're tuning in from. Uh, we have Tamara Lackey today. She's going to talk to us about authentically posing your subjects. It's going to be a really great, great webinar for all of you who are joining us. And I just want to ask you to bear with us a little bit. We're all working, um, you know, from home with, with what we've got. So if things get a little glitchy or if mistakes happen, just we just ask be a little extra forgiving for us. We're trying our best here. Um, thank you all for joining us, letting us know where you're from. It's cool to see where you guys are all tuning in from. So it looks like the number of attendees entering has kind of leveled out right now. So I guess I'll go ahead and, and get started. Um, I wanna thank you all for joining us today with Tamara Lackey. She's gonna to talk to us about uh, posing your subjects authentically. It's, she has a really great presentation for us. I wanna let you guys know that there is a coupon code for Tamara's book that you can use on the Rocky Nook website. It was in your uh, registration email and it will also be emailed to you tomorrow with the replay link. So tomorrow you'll get an email with a replay link to watch this webinar again, if, if you'd like, and a coupon code to uh, buy Tamara's book from the Rocky Nook website for 40% off. I'll also post that coupon code in the chat for you guys. And we, we did also just want to mention that if you've already read the book and if you liked it and enjoyed it and you, you want to help us out and you want to help Tamara out, a review on Amazon really goes a long way. Uh, it helps other people know, you know, what you liked about the book and what they can learn in it. So that's one great way to, you know, help out um, our photographers and authors right now with, without even leaving your home. So without further ado, I know you guys didn't come here to hear me talk. I'm going to introduce Tamara and let her take it over. So she has just written a book, the, oh, why am I, I'm missing, mixing up the words here. The Photographer's Guide to Photographing Kids. That's not the correct word. I will Posting let Tamara take it from here. <laughs> Hi, Tamara. Hi, how are you? How are everybody doing? Um, really cool to see where everyone's coming from. Wow. I am in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. It is pelting rain outside and has been all night. Um, I think that's kind of going up and down the coast. But um, I want to talk to you today about uh, my new book, which is called The Posing Playbook for Photographing Kids. I'm going to throw That's that up it. in a second. I had yeah. some of the words right. It. It um, <laughs> there's photography, there's portraits. But um, what I'd love to do is kind of give you an overview of the presentation I'm going to be giving. Um, and then walk you through some visuals in terms of really illustrating what I go into in the book, but also my process as it comes to photographing. I am going to switch to screen share right now. Uh, this is, by the way, this is the book. And uh, I'll jump into that more. But as we're talking, I'm actually going to just pull some passages as, as we go. All right, I'm going to jump to sharing screen and just confirm that all looks good. Looking good? Looks good, we can see your screen, right. thank you. Great, um, okay, so uh, the, the book is called <laughs> Posing Playbook for Photographing Kids. I have been a portrait photographer professionally now for 17 years, um, which is nuts to me, but a lot of what I'm gonna be talking to you about today is um, what I've tried to break down in terms of my process, because as I'm sure a lot of you know, especially if you've been photographing um, for a while, some of this just becomes so innate and it takes a minute to step back and really step through what it is that your process, um, what makes your photography work, what fits your style. And that's so much of what we'll be talking about today is uh, posing for sure, but some of the elements that have to go around it to ensure that the pose you created is as authentic as possible and also shot well. I am happily a Nikon ambassador, and so I'm gonna be talking um, just a bit about the gear I use, knowing that everybody's using a variety of brands, and so I'm using kind of generic gear um, overviews so that everybody can relate. All right, so um, modern portrait photography, I think, um, is what I would call what I do and have been doing for a while, and what that means to me is using the 
traditional methods of photography that I find to be so impactful as it relates to exposure and some, some posing guidelines and lighting, uh, but mixing that up with authentic expression and a real um, a genuine lifestyle feel. And I think that combination for me is what I consider the most compelling way to photograph portraits. Um, this book is mostly about children's photography, but so many of these principles go into play when I'm photographing uh, pets and animals, adults, um, all kinds of photojournalistic things I do with my uh, TV show, Chasing Frames. And so a lot of these component, components just come into play time and time again. Here are the main things, and these are definitely not all the things, but here are the main things that I'm thinking about as I'm going through my process with each and every shoot. One is just making sure I have the gear I need to produce the results I want. Uh, number two is exposure, just constantly keeping in mind um, what is the best way to showcase this subject and what's the exposure that I want to pull together in terms of um, ISO and shutter speed and aperture. I shoot everything in a manual mode, so I'm constantly moving all the, all the buttons. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, everything I refer to, even if you don't shoot in manual mode, still is uh, what you want to think about when you're shooting maybe one of the priority modes. And then lighting. Um, lighting varies a lot. I use a lot of different types of lighting. I'll talk to you about that in a second. But um, a good number of these images are shot with nothing more than flash and reflector. Um, I do use strobes and I do use uh, continuous lighting, but a good number of these are just using some sort of fill and additive light to natural light. Posing, of course. Um, and then expression, this authenticity that I care to see so much in my photographs. Now, like I said, that's not everything. There's composition, there's framing, there's clothing, there's location, there's so many other elements, but we're gonna kinda just talk about this as we go forward. Uh, uh, this is just a shot of some of my gear. Um, some of the main lenses that I'll be talking to you about, I'll, I'll step through and say why I would grab one over the other. But for the most part, I am shooting with the Z mirrorless cameras, uh, just because they're so lightweight and uh, the image quality is so strong but I'm also using the D850 and the D5 quite a lot too. Um, I'm grabbing the D5 if I want a lot of speed. I want something that's gonna grab a shot and give me 12 frames per second the second it happens. Um, that said, I think that, you know, I know the D6 is coming out now and there's comparable models across brands, but to me having like a lightweight, really strong image quality camera, which is the Z or even the D850, um, and combined with some camera that gets a lot of speed, gives me the pretty much full breadth of what I'll need when shooting. I have other gear as well because we do a lot of filming, um, but that's, uh, that's the main cameras I'm talking about. When people ask about what to invest in or where they should invest next, I, I always advocate for getting really strong lenses, even if you only get one or two, versus um, putting all your money on the top of the line camera and getting average lenses. I can talk to that later if people have questions, but um, there's some pretty compelling reasons for me as to why I would always go that way. Uh, these are some of the main lenses I'm using almost all the time. There's uh, three to four that I'm, I'm using pretty consistently and a couple that I'm using all the time. And this one, you know, the portrait lens is the one I'm using on every single shoot I do. Um, there are a variety of lens uh, these are the prime lenses I'm using. Of course, you can use zoom lens. I, I mostly use primes uh, with a couple exceptions, which I'll talk about in a second. But the 105-14 lens is my favorite, favorite lens. I'm using it all the time. Um, I also love the 85 millimeter. I don't as much use the 135 or other, uh, other focal lens, but I know a number of people would say that's their favorite lens. But the big thing about the portrait lens for me is it's just simply the most flattering look um, that you can achieve when photographing people. And a lot of optics quality goes into that, but it kind of creates a situation where you're gonna be far enough aback that you're flattering your subject and you're gonna have hopefully a good amount of room as it relates to your depth of field. I tend to shoot very shallow. Uh, this image, for instance, was shot at an F1.6. I'm gonna to talk to this image later, um, showing you how I started, which was not very well in <laughs> what I got to. Um, I'll be doing that um, a number of times this presentation, starting out with the before and then telling you the exact steps to get to the after, which is the, the bulk of what the book is about.
So there's the portrait lens and it gives me images like this. The image on the right is shot at an F1.4. The reason this depth of field looks so soft and buttery and creamy right, side, right outside of her eyes is because I'm shooting as close as possible and shooting at that extreme shallow depth of field, which gives me those really bright, sharp eyes and then everything else goes soft. The image on the left, this is shot from a distance. This is not shot at an F1.4, but more like a 2.8. And um, this again gives me that really flattering look. I've got really clean lines. I don't have any distortion in the shot. Uh, it is the lens I'm using most often on my shoots. Here's another example. This is shot with the 85 millimeter. This is being able to be relatively close to my subject. Um, shooting from a very low angle, having her lean into me. This will be somewhat of, I'm talking about as we go through because using the idea of framing to help emphasize expression is really powerful. So deciding what angle to shoot from and how your subject meets you at that angle can really convey a lot uh, as it relates to uh, genuine nature, interaction, interest level. In this same experience right here while I'm photographing this girl, I'm shooting from lower and she's sitting down and leaning in a little bit. And um, as I move a little bit lower, I have her pretty dramatically leaning lean in towards me. If you're looking at the shot from the outside, it would look odd because of how far forward she's leaning, but it allows me to create this dynamic composition where I'm shooting on a diagonal and I'm doing that to make this a more interesting composition and to position her eyes in the upper right hand quadrant of the photograph in terms of you know, meeting that rule of th thirds that can be really striking in portraits. And I'm having her lean dramatically forward so it shows that she's interesting. It flatters her and it shows um, that she is interested in this experience. So when the viewer is looking at this image, they can really connect to her eyes, their position from a composition perspective in a location that draws you in. And you can see simply by her body language that she is interacting with you, which keeps you in the image a little bit longer. So that's kind of an example of why I would choose a certain lens and what I'd be thinking about as it relates to composition and expressiveness. This is my uh, 70 to 200. I use this uh, regularly, not as often as the 105 and the 2470, which I'm gonna get into next. But this is a fantastic lens uh, for when your subjects just need some distance from you. And I find, especially when photographing children, whether it's other people's children, my clients, my, my children, uh, sometimes the best results I'm going to get are when I step far back and then zoom in at that 200 millimeter. Um, just being able to give some energetic space to the shot that really works very well with um, more introspective subjects, um, more introverted subjects, um, subjects who find it more playful and you'll get, you're gonna get a different expression when you go farther away and are, uh, are being kind of goofy or silly or whatever your personal style is from that distance. It's also, of course, a fantastic lens for more documentary style, more genuine, and lifestyle shots where you're simply getting things that are happening in the moment and you're not so close to your subject that you are creating something that will be less authentic. Um, and what I mean by that is some subjects, some people will respond so, so well with close contact, interaction, um, that give and take. And for other subjects, it will shut them down. That's the last thing you want if you want an authentic look. And for those situations, being able to step back can be really impactful. Um, that image on the right, the, uh, the raptor, that shot is um, simply, again, where I'd be shooting with the 200 if I have to go from a distance and get subjects far away. That would be more like a 300 millimeter shot. This is another great example. I was uh, photographing this girl. We're just on a simple lawn, like a green grass lawn. And um, it's later in the day, so you can see that sun kind of dropping. And she is uh, just running around. And I'm sure we've all had those subjects where, you know, yeah, I'd get a great portrait of them if I could catch them, if I could stop them. And in this case, what I found is by simply shooting um, 
in a very fast shutter speed, uh, being uh, very mindful of shooting to be able to know that I'm only going to get a quick second with her. So I'm maybe at uh, one two thousandth of a second, one one thousandth of a second at a minimum. And I'm shooting far back. This is shot at the 200 millimeter. And me giving her space calms her down because she's kind of looking back to me as if to ask, where are you going? And as she's still being playful and just laying on her back on the ground, I'm actually tilting my shot. So it looks again, more interesting. It looks like it's a little bit more in motion than if she were just laying flat. And I'm tilting my lens in a way where I'm getting some of that flare coming into the, the camera, into the lens to showcase a little bit more of that ambiance that makes this image more interesting, um, but not so much so that I'm, I'm kind of blowing out the shot or getting you know, some of the uh, not wanted flare parts of the image. So um, for me, being able to step back and zoom in gives me the opportunity to get those quick shots. This is like one in 10 shots that I loved and the other nine are just, she's got her head away from the camera or face down in the grass or all the things that you'd find when you're photographing children. Um, macro, uh, I love the 105 macro lens, the 2.8. Um, there's a lot of macro options. There's an 85, a 60, I know there's a 50. This uh, longer lens macro though, I, I love it for obviously images like this where you can simply just, you know, kind of choose your focus and get some, you know, kind of lovely uh, images of things, you know, all around you. I think a lot of people right now are shooting macro shots as they are uh, staying home. I know I'm certainly doing a lot of macro photography. And uh, the beautiful thing with that, of course, is, and you know, you can take a small patch of grass and get all kinds of subjects right there. But uh, the other thing I really like the macro for is, um, oh, I just had to throw this in. I just love this image. Just all the colors just popped. Um, this is simply, obviously, a butterfly, but I love all the textures and patterns in this. But back to kids. Um, the 105 to 8 also makes a great portrait lens. I don't have the ability to shoot as shallow as I would with a, a 1.4 f-stop, um, and I don't have uh, exactly the same optic quality that I would have with the 105 1.4. That said, I can still use this lens um, in, in multiple ways. Is I can use it as a portrait lens, just like I used it for these two images. Um, I can use it as a macro lens. And then I can also use it for a faster to focus lens than you might think. If I have a subject running towards me and I'm shooting with the 105-1.4, I'm far less likely to get a, sh a sharp quick shot than it would be with shooting with this lens, the 2.8. So it's another reason to kind of bring that in to the fold. This lens I use on every shoot. If I have to choose two lenses I'm using on every shoot, it's the 24-70-2.8 and the 105. One for for me, and this is just I don't know what I'm walking into. Anything can happen. Let me grab a lens. It's fast to focus, has a wide range from a focal length, um, and I can do a lot when I don't know what I'm going to be seeing or experiencing on a shoot. All right, so let's jump a little bit into lighting. Of course, if you have more questions about gear, about cameras, about lenses, go ahead and leave your question, and we're going to have room for questions at the end. But um, that's kind of a quick overview so you understand what I'm referring to as we go forward. Lighting, um, this is not gonna be a lighting uh, course, but I do have a chunk about lighting in the book, a good, a good uh, chapter on it, and I do refer to it as I go. I, uh, I think lighting is something that you can adapt and manipulate in such a dramatic way that it uh, changes all your portraits. And what I'm gonna be showing you here is a pretty loose, way to showcase lighting. Um, in this case, I'm actually in Dubai. I was doing a workshop there. We're in the Arabian desert and um, I'm photographing simply just a family. And this is using the existing light. I'm, I'm using a light in front of them to light them. And it's, uh, you know, I would say it's about 4, 4 p.m. or so in terms of how that lighting, what you'd be used to. And this is the shot. It's a clean, simple shot from a lighting perspective. This same image shot in a different direction, um, adjusting the lighting to be more silhouetted is, has a whole different look from a lighting perspective. And this is just as I'm talking about lighting, adding light, not adding light, position yourself uh, as it relates to exposure. And, and in this case, you know, it's silhouetted. We have these two 
figures um, far in the distance, and it's just a really minimalist shot having um, a, a lighting that's tuned in to be almost a sepia black and white, but this is the color shot. And then this, um, I love this shot. I worked really hard for this shot. This is a silhouette, uh, positioning myself so the lighting is directly behind him, just that dropping on that dropping late afternoon sun. And one of the things uh, that strikes me about this portrait is it's very much shot with pose in mind. And with silhouettes, if you do not have a thoughtful pose or interaction in place, it just looks like clumps of people, you know, outlined against a light. And so in this case, we had this little girl, this little boy, excuse me, running up to his mom. And the first, you know, series of shots just were awkward. You could see two figures, but there was much expressiveness in a silhouette. Obviously, you have to work to get expressiveness in a silhouette. And, um, and the little adjustments here were, you know, I asked her to put her hands farther out so she could kind of grab him before he got to her. That, that gave us that idea that these are two figures, not just one two headed figure. And I wanted to, I asked him to just like, put his fingers straight out and I'd show him my fingers spread out. And that gave me that look that you can see his hands are reaching for her. Again, otherwise, if you think about a silhouette, it looks like one long arm coming out because the hands are closer together. And uh, right down to the fact that I asked her to pop her ponytail out and just pull it away so I could see that ponytail come up versus it just be lost to give more of you know, her look, show that this is a mom as the boy's running to her. All these things combined are the things we're thinking about when you're altering the lighting, what you have to think about with posing and expression. A um, little bit more about lighting, some simple, simple tools. Uh, I do a lot of shots in front of windows, especially in a situation like many are today where we're working from home or we're photographing from home. Um, I am uh, plopping my kid now <laughs> in front of a window, um, exposing it so it's very, very bright behind them and then using a reflector to fill the light in and so I have what looks like it could be against a white background but it's just the blown out background and the fill light um, adjusting so the subject is well exposed here this is out on the beach oh I miss the beach um, we're out on the beach and this shot um, this uh, I had this little boy jump again and again and again this this uh, ninja jump and he was all too happy to do so but um, it, you know, one of the running themes that I'm going to talk about is uh, how many attempts I take to get the final shot. And it, that's actually not um, necessarily a bad thing. It means I'm looking for some variety in my work and I want to shoot something a little more creative this next time. And, uh, and often I, I learn a lot along the way by trying something again and again so that the next time I do it, it becomes more second nature. But here I was just trying to set this up. I knew I was shooting with backlight. I had a reflector down right in front of the daughter right here, which gave me some light in her eyes. The, the four in the background are not in front of a reflector, but they do have this backlight and they all have this bounce of light against the sand. It's not super bright like it would be if the sun were sharply overhead, but it's still a light fill that's coming up and helping to fill in my subjects. Um, this is a simple bounce flash. I know a lot of people have questions about using flash. Um, flash photography is its own kind of subset in terms of where you can really drill down and learn a lot as it relates to using flash. But the simplest method is to, um, is to simply set your flash to TTL and bounce it against the ceiling or a window or a wall and, um, and just swiveling the head so that the flash goes up on the ceiling. In this case, that's what I did here. Uh, you could also use this in a manual mode and, and just fill in what you need, just step it down so you just have that little pop of light in the eyes. I often do that. Um, I mostly use flash to fill in shadows and light and create a little bit more um, depth to an image versus just a full flash straight on. I almost hardly ever use that. If it does, if I am taking a shot and the flash is straight on, it's dialed down to just fill in the shadows. All right, let's dive into expressiveness and authenticity. Um, a few things I'm thinking in mind as I am photographing subjects are um, just some, some uh, I don't know, I was gonna say rules of the road. 
<laughs> but um, you know, one is responding to what you see. I, when I walk into a scenario, I'm photographing a kid, or if you're photographing somebody um, that you don't know that well, you don't know much about them. So getting a quick read on your subjects, I, again, I have a couple chapters about that little kind of tips that have helped me to really shape the shoot to be able to respond to the person I'm seeing in front of me in a way that is most effective to getting authentic portraits. So responding to what you see versus just walking in and saying, this is my style, this is how I shoot, and that's that. Because what you may do naturally would work amazingly well for one subject, but it will completely shut the other one down. So seeing what you're gonna walk into as it relates to your subject's personality, um, letting go of any set ideas. I try to brainstorm kind of a few ideas and poses before I go into a shoot, but really want to keep that loose because the amount of times I started with something and what I got was so much better because I just responded to the individual um, is just dramatically larger. That is such a dramatically larger part of what I'm doing is responding to what I see and starting with something but then they kind of step in and they give uh, such a better shot. <laughs> I put let it go of any sense of dignity. Yeah, sometimes I think the best portraits are where you, you just can't care how you look or what, you know, in terms of what you've got to do to get the shot and what you've got to do to get the expression. Keeping your subjects with you, um, that means uh, emotionally, actually from a tension perspective and then physically. You know, so from an emotion or an attention perspective, um, I have to refresh my subjects again and again because every type of subject will zone out, will get bored, will want to move on to the next thing. And you've got to find a way to you know, quickly get their attention again, time and time again. Um, that's one of the things uh, that I think about when I say keeping your subjects with you. Another one is trying to create a scenario where you're, especially younger subjects, where you are, have physical boundaries in place <laughs> to make this an easier thing. So um, my, what that might mean is multiple things, but maybe it's shooting, if you're shooting outside in a park, picking a corner of the park and, um, and kind of having some, you know, quote unquote posts where you say, don't go past that tree, don't go this or that. There's a million examples I can give you there. But the idea of realizing that if all you're doing is chasing your subject around, you're not going to be able to set up um, a more optimal shot. And then lastly, using reinforcements as needed. I'm constantly calling in a sister to help with a brother or a parent to come in and do something. Um, obviously, I really love uh, working with an assistant. I did not shoot with an assistant for the first nine years of my career, simply because I didn't think I wanted to spend the money there. Um, I didn't want to deal with having to arrange for somebody, et cetera. And once I started finally shooting with an assistant, it changed my photography because it allowed me to do so much more with a little bit of help. So um, I love the idea of using reinforcements. As a professional photographer, being able to change the shots I was taking and have more control over the shoots allowed me to sell the prints, um, you know, certainly at a higher rate and have a higher amount of sales. So it more than took care of the cost of hiring an assistant. So just some food for thought there. Um, so the idea of photographing subjects authentically, a lot of it is laughter and play and sweetness, but other aspects are simply, who do you see when you, when you walk in and what are they conveying to you? Uh, with this little boy, he had a wonderful smile and a great laugh. Um, but he also just had a way of holding himself, as you can see here, that, you know, just piercing eyes and, um, and a pretty dramatic, you know, com but combined sweet look to him. I don't know. I just love his look. And with this image, all we, all we did was I had him just kind of put one arm over the other just to give some more um, visual interest to the composition. Uh, but the rest was pretty simple. This was shot with a 105-2-8. Um, and that bounce of light you see on one side is just by positioning him next to a white wall when the sun was dropping in the sky, or not dropping in the sky, rising in the sky. This was shot kind of early, early afternoon. Um, this image I had shown you earlier, um, I wanna walk through how I got to this image. This image was uh, photographed out just in a park bench, you know, really nondescript area in terms of impact, and that's, often where I find myself shooting because 
because of circumstance, I try to create the best case scenario. But um, in this case, you know, there, this is where I am shooting. It's, you know, it's just a field. It's a little shady area. It's a bright, bright, crazy sunny day. Optimally, I'm not shooting at that time of day, but everybody here who photographs portraits probably knows there are times where that's the time you're going to have to shoot for one reason or another and to kind of build in the toolkit you need to be able to pull that off. In this case, I'm photographing her under a tree. We've got some shade. I'm making sure she's not like in that spackled light. I'm shooting with the Z7 camera, the mirrorless camera, and I have the 105, 14 lens. I'm at the, the um, just a little farther back than the distance I need to be and uh, to be able to get her completely in the shot. And I have my SB5000 flash, and I'm, in this case, I'm using it just to fill in the shadows. I'm shooting with a manual flash and just kind of dialing down um, the effect of the light. And I've got the reflector obviously behind me. My assistant is holding that. Um, so I'm starting out and I'm starting out. If you look at this, this image on the left is, all right, let me click. Let me see what my lighting looks like. Let's see what we've got. And as I'm looking at that shot, there's a few things that, that strike me right away. Um, I don't like how her knee is um, kind of cutting through that shot. So I, uh, well, there's a few things going on actually. So let me start with the image on the left. That image on the left, she's just lost in this shot. Um, she is, there's nothing really compelling about uh, the pose or the expression. And I feel like there's just really not a lot to this. So I'm switching that middle image. I'm switching to a close up vertical shot. shot. I actually at this point shut off the flash because I thought the reflector was doing a good job. And I opened my aperture up even more to an F1.6. I initially started around a two, F2. So I shot this to at an F1.6. And, um, and I'd already taken care of what I wanted to take care of from a lighting perspective. I knew I had my technical settings. I did all this um, and then shot a couple test shots while talking with her. And of course, I wasn't even thinking about expression yet because I wasn't there. I try not to worry about getting to the expression I want for that kind of final shot until everything else is in place. Because if you get that great expression, but something's way off, you kind of lost the moment. So that part happens last. Um, here I had her, um, so I had her set up. I like the aperture, um, but from a posing perspective, again, that knee is just cutting through the bottom middle of the shot. And I don't like that. So I asked her to change her positioning. So she is crossing her arms at her elbow elbows and just leaning forward a little bit more. You can kind of see a bit of a difference there between that middle shot and that image on the right. Um, from a composition perspective, you know, this one move, just having, you know, her lean forward a little bit, bring one hand up to hold her onto her side braid. Um, it just takes us away from that jarring break in the middle of the shot, gives us more of a pleasing U shape in terms of what's on the bottom of the portrait now. Um, her arms kind of act like a vignette to the portrait which you'll see more in, the, in that final image again. Um, and then having her lean forward also ensures that I have a sharper focus on her eyes. Sometimes that can happen if you know, you've got a top to bottom shot, um, if you're less likely to get sometimes the sharpness that you want in the eyes and just simply having them lean forward a little bit can really change that. And then on that image on the right, that's where I get to the point where I want to lighten up her expression and I'm going to vary my interaction style a lot. You know, right, I'm just going to get, let's get ready, let's talk, let's see what I want. And now I'm getting close to what I know will be the final shot I want. So that's when I get her to interact. Um, she's laughing, she's being very goofy. I've got the hand where I want it, I've got the composition where I want it, I've got the exposure that I want, the lighting is there. And then, so the only thing I do from the image on the right to the final image is I just let her smile soften a little bit. And it just kind of comes down. She gets the shot, I take an image, and that's beautiful. There's a couple beats and it rests. And then I get the final image, the one I wanted to work towards. But obviously, as you can see, it doesn't start right away. These little kind of thoughts and ideas, one image after another after another is where I finally get to when I wanted to go, but I certainly didn't start there. Um, this is a great example of um, kind of starting out with not much, um, knowing that right away I saw this super bright, 
it was a super bright day. Um, there's a mural downtown um, where I live, in, actually in Raleigh, North Carolina. And I knew when I saw that dram dramatic diagonal in the part of the mural that I'd want to create a more dramatic portrait with it. Um, and because, again, I knew I was going to be shooting in black and white, I wasn't too worried at all about you know, color balance, like the face, the color on the face, et cetera. You can see that all varies because I'm using a really contrasty lighting technique, which I'll talk about in one second. Um, so kind of setting her up, I knew that um, I was working with a subject who was interested in setting up a shot. Many subjects are not. They're like, can, let's just, you have to interact with them. You've just got to make something. But you'll get those subjects who just love the idea of modeling and playing with you. So here, um, the sunlight's super sharp. So I have her leaning forward slightly to help diffuse the light. So just kind of control it coming across her face. Um, and I'm adjusting my angle to keep that framing consistent. So I'm naturally creating a bit of an illusion where this was shot from a more straight on perspective and composing the image so her head would tilt down, you know, right at that midpoint of that sharp line. Um, so I liked a lot of this composition. I liked where I was starting. I liked the contrasty light on her, again, because I know I'm gonna go to a black and white contrasty shot. What I don't like is her eyes open. It feels too forced, the expression's not there. So I switch it up and I just say, can you just gently close your eyes? And I know the second I say that, uh, just based on experience, I say gently close your eyes. What you get is kind of a strained eye close. It's pretty normal. Uh, you, someone just told you to do something, you're doing the command, you're not necessarily feeling it yet. And so that I just let them rest a bit and I make a point of saying, let's just keep them close. I'm just doing something, take a break, ignore me. Um, so we've got that going on. And I just needed a few more tiny shifts until I wanted to get to the shot I got to. And um, so, you know, some of those flyaways on her face, um, I knew I needed to clean that up a little bit. As you can see, I kind of come in and I'm adjusting that. That's the wider shot to show you what I'm getting. Um, if you look in that bottom left-hand corner, you can see the reflector bouncing that light really sharply up at her. But um, so I'm just coming in and taking care of these little details because I know that I do not want to spend a ton of time cleaning that up in post. So taking a few minutes to just get that on the spot makes a big difference, especially for flyaway hairs. So um, ask her to ignore me completely. You know, um, we got that kind of set up. And at that time, as she's kind of ignoring me and, and letting it go, her eyes are also resting more. And um, and I'm using a combination of flash and reflector. So the reflector is giving me this really sharp contrasty light that's gonna aid me in this high contrast black and white. And the fill light from the reflector is kind of acting as a bit as like a hair light, which gives us a nice separation from the background, creating like a rim light uh, when you're, but that I don't have a rim light here and the reflector is, is creating that for me. It's a really subtle, subtle shift from a lighting perspective, but it's really notable to me. Um, I'm shooting with the 105 f1.4 lens and I'm capturing this at an f3.2. I love the shot. I love the shot. Um, it's not that often that you see a shot while you're out and you get it. I mean, like when you see what you want from a shot and it comes through. So um, I, I love that we got to this. It, you can also see some of the things I did afterwards in terms of post. Obviously, I made it a black and white shot. But if you kind of look back here earlier, you see that little gap in the brick. Um, I just kind of closed that in because it was distracting, I think, the viewer from seeing the subject. Little things like that I might do if I see smudges or dirt. And I just want you to have a kind of a cleaner shot, still that grittiness, um, but see your subject. That's, that's the kind of thing I would be doing. Um, all right, I'm going to show a video. I hope everyone's Zoom connections are good enough to see it. But a lot of what I'm talking about in terms of making adjustments on the fly, switching out lenses, changing poses. Um, sometimes it has to be done pretty briskly, and but you've got to keep the interaction going. So this next video, it's two minutes or so, um, it'll show you kind of how that's happening in, um, in a pretty normal way. And I'm taking a lot of different shots using different um, techniques. And at the end of the video, I'll step through and show you exactly you can see this is what I was getting here and this is what I got to and why. So hopefully you guys get this okay.
she has an obsession with unicorns, I think, or just loves them. And she has like five or six dresses and shirts that are like unicorn. So this is the first thing I'd love for you to do. Come here, ready? You're gonna sit here, right? And you're gonna go like this. Watch me. Yep, your legs aren't the same length. That wouldn't make sense to you. Try this. See? Yep. And then flip it back. How about right there? There. there, there, there. I'm gonna flip you up. And so, okay, so this part, see this? All good. Do not change. Yeah. And you're set up like there's like something. Put, yeah, oh my goodness. Say, come back. That was brilliant. Yes. Yep. I'd love to use a reflector for this. I'm going to turn off the flash. And we'll use the bold reflector. And just to kind of see where oh, that light really drops. But I think it's got it right here. See this? Face goes over here. Yes. Okay. Just like that. Don't move. That's so good. Don't move. All right. Now glance over at me. Say, oh, hello, camera. <laughs> And then, okay, this is what's happening now. <laughs> okay. 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 Look the other way. Go. I like the side lighting. That's great. We're going to try up here. We're back. Play, yes. All right. That is good. Let's get some flash on there. Like there. Okay, I have to sneak the all over my subject. <laughs> okay, ready? <laughs> That's so perfect. Oh my gosh, wait, wait. Okay, this looks ridiculously pretty. Beautiful. Such a good job. Excellent. And now I'm going to give you a rock. <laughs> Oh my gosh, she's so cute. Um, okay, so <laughs> here is where I'm starting. I'll show you quickly what I get to. These are the images I wanted. But um, I'm starting here. You, you uh, see that the, um, the expression's still a little forced. She's still kind of curling her lip up and she's looking the opposite way than I wanted her to. Um, the, the framing in terms of what I have composed in the shot um, there's just a lot of extra stuff in there that I don't need. I want to take that out of the shot and, and you know, shoot a little closer and get a little bit of a tighter shot. Um, and then in that same position, doing very similar things, uh, it can be a dramatic difference here. You know, she's curled up on the bench. I'm helping her adjust her jacket and shirt, as you saw in the video. And um, having her twist back and forth while keeping her knees and feet in the same place you know, it's a way to keep her engaged while I'm determining the best angle from which to shoot. <laughs> and so I'm testing the lighting. I'm, you know, either adding the flash or just sticking with the reflector. And I'm talking to her while I'm doing that. So she's staying engaged. That's the idea of keeping your subjects with you. Um, the, uh, the other thing I noticed, you know, from these earlier shots to this sh shot, um, the shallower my depth of field was, the more that, you know, glowing golden look of the sunset against the windows that golden light you know reflected back in the window is just beautiful and so um, one of the reasons I'm shifting here I don't necessarily need a very shallow depth of field but the more shallow um, my depth of field the more I'm getting that glossy look behind her so um, you know she's here she's twisting back and forth I'm telling her to go faster um, and she's, laugh while she's laughing while she's trying to keep up and I'm able to get these just quick quick shots here, this is when she rolled over and jumped onto the bench. You know, it was cute. She had a good expression. Um, my first click is, of course, you know, so often not what I want. But, um, you know, she, she did some of the work. She crossed one arm over the other. You know, it was an, an immediately a, a charming kind of feel. She's tilting her chin back while laughing. And I love the fun expressiveness. But I'm losing that effect, like her sparkling eyes um, when she has her head tilted that far back and they really do sparkle she was so engaged it was just it's so easy to work with a subject that um, there's so much expressiveness in her eyes and I'm losing that here because of how this shot is set up um, and then I'm shooting a ready at an f2 because it's such a cluttery background once she shifted and moved there's like a car behind here there's some raggedy trees um, it's not a great look so I'm dropping my aperture just to get rid of some of that clutter and not have 
the viewer distracted by uh, all that and missing out on my subject's expression. I change my angle pretty dramatically at this point when I'm getting this and I, and I shoot from a higher level. Um, so again, she can look more up towards me and I can have that, you know, really great expression, but um, I now see the focus on her eyes. And there's not a lot changed here other than maybe I drop my aperture a little bit more. I go from an F2.8 to an F, uh, excuse me, an F2.2, uh, <laughs> an F2 to an F1.8. And um, and then so even some of those distracting elements in the background, you know, I'm shooting the angle from this angle. So some of them aren't even in there. And the little pieces that are, are even more out of focus. I'm shooting closer to her, which lets me have that background be even more out of focus. And, um, and then I'm adding a flash. You saw I popped a flash on. Um, I had the flash on the whole time. I just turn it on or turn it off. It's way too difficult to physically put it on and off if I'm using it you know, uh, on or off in various shots. Um, but here I just clicked it back to on and, um, and I have it right set so that I'm filling in some of those shadows. You can see the effect from the left to the right, just a bit more contrast gives you a bit more pop um, and gives you, I think, a more striking image. Uh, this is when she jumped up, uh, or I actually, I uh, guided her uh, up to this newspaper bin uh, gosh, you just don't see newspaper bins that often anymore because they're, they're really great little tools to use for posing. Um, but here I put her up on this uh, newspaper box. i now shooting with a 70 to 200 28 lens. As you saw, I was shooting from farther back and shooting low from the ground. And you know, right away we have a few notable problems. Uh, that backlight is so, so strong. And um, what that does is it blows out all the detail in her hair, which takes away from this shot. And, um, and just, again, if your eye goes to the point of most contrast, in this case, what you're, you're seeing is that hair first. You kind of squint your eyes a little bit, you see that hair first. So I don't want that, I want you to see her first. I don't mind some backlighting, but not that much. Um, so, you know, there's a couple things you can do here. You can use a scrim, you can use a diffuser just to soften how bright that comes in. Um, but you could also, in this specific case, just have her lean forward at the waist, which gives, again, that interactive style where she's kind of more engaged with you and it's a more flattering look. But also as she's leaning forward a little bit, you're getting out of that super bright highlights back there and just controlling the issue right away. Um, I'm shooting at an aperture of f2.8 with the 70 to 200. And, um, and I'm getting her in a way, I'm getting her set up in a way where I'm managing that over brightness in the background. Um, I've got her eyes now coming more towards the camera. <laughs> if you look at that image on the right, that's her dad, like just stopping her from falling down. <laughs> you know, she went too far forward and that's why I have him right there. And, um, and then all I need at this point is for him to, you know, move his hand away and for me to get her, her you know, in focus looking at me. And that's where I get to this shot. Um, I love the combination of golds in this image. She, you know, we had a gold reflector. You could see that in the video. Uh, there's this golden light behind her, of course. So that makes her highlights in her hair look gold. And we've got gold, you know, stars on her skirt and her jacket is gold. Uh, there's even some gold highlights in her eyes because of that gold reflector. It just all comes together so well, but I'm starting with this. Like, no, 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 ah. <laughs> um, so uh, those are some things I'm consistently, you know, kind of striving for. How do I get rid of the problems and how do I enhance the parts that are working? Uh, we've got this little boy, you know, we're out in the middle of a super sunny day. Again, um, this, it wasn't super sunny. It was one of those mornings where right away the sun got so sharp and it's only nine o'clock, you know, that sort of thing. And, um, but we found this very unremarkable patch of twigs around some scraggly trees. And I knew that to make this shot more interesting, I would have to not only blow out the background, but kind of take him out of all these scraggly trees. So I have him plopped down right there. You can see in the shot, um, I've got him positioned in a way where that background, God, I'm so dirty. Look at all that, it's just dirt all over me. Um, but in the background, it's really bright in that light coming in. But I know that if I'm shooting at, again, um, an aperture 
where I'm not going to have to worry about that too much. That goes away. And, but bringing him down to the ground, what that does is it starts to, now I'm not there with expression yet, obviously, but what it starts to do is really fade out um, that, that scraggly foreground because I'm shooting closer to my subject, um, getting rid of a lot of that wood chip ground covering, which is such a bland element, you know, to dominate a portrait. And um, I'm not only, you know, laying flat on the ground and, and uh, looking towards him, but I'm asking him again to, to meet me a little bit, to say, hey, I'm leaning in towards you, why don't you lean in towards me? Um, he's positioned against that lighter background. And again, that also takes out those trees. And I'm adding a fill flash to be able to brighten him up because that backlighting, of course, is so, so sharp. Um, so the fill light brightens up some of those shadows and, you know, just doing this alone fixed a lot of the issues, but there's still some awkwardness in his expression. He's clearly kind of looking at me in a way like he doesn't quite know what to do. And there's awkwardness in the pose. You see his hands just kind of dropping down there. It's pretty unnatural. Um, and to my eye, from this angle, they command a lot of attention where I don't want you to focus. And, um, and then one of the simplest things I did was to tell him to take one hand and hug the other. You know, the younger the kid, the more you give just ridiculous uh, descriptions to get what you want versus, hey, position your hands together just so. And um, so he starts to do that and is, you know, just naturally as he puts his hands together, he's going to lean in a little bit. And so that's already happening. Um, and it's creating that strong sense of engagement uh, between the subject and the viewer and I just need his expression to shift a little bit and I get to this. So you know to me you, you wouldn't necessarily think that there's a ton that's different between this and this but to me it's a whole different portrait and a lot of it is just these tiny little tweaks. I've got most of this figured out. I've just got a few little tweaks. Um, Lastly, uh, we're going to do one more kind of walkthrough. I could obviously go on and on, and I do in the book. <laughs> I really do. But um, we've got this sweet little subject, this little girl in my studio, shooting on a seamless backdrop, a, a gray backdrop. backdrop. And um, I'm now li I'm lighting this with strobes, with the B2, uh, the Profoto B2 strobes, using a beauty dish as the main modifier. Um, I'm showing her how to position her hands and she's starting. You can see on the very left, we're starting with that. She's listening to me. You can actually see her kind of paying attention to what I'm saying. Um, the image on in the middle, um, we're getting uh, the pose more natural. I've got her more engaged. Uh, it's super cute. I'm managing that spillover um, a little bit. You, you see on the far left, we've got some spillover on the right, on the middle shot. And when I mean spillover, I mean the bright light hitting her cheek. Um, I still have some more, um, so or, or I still have some, it's less, but I still have some. And then the image on the right, what I have her do is just start walking back and forth a little bit and I add a fan into the mix. And the fan is just a fun element for kids anyway. I don't have it on that high, just a little bit of a breeze. And as she's rocking back and forth, I'm getting motion, but I'm also getting those moments where I don't even have to stop and go shift the light. I'm gonna get that, that spillover control because of her positioning. And I say that because so often if you're photographing models or you're photographing adults who listen, you know, all that sort of thing, you have time to go and adjust the lights. You have time to tweak your flash just, just so. You have time to do a lot more elaborate, detailed lighting. But when you have a young subject and you really want authenticity and you're doing the best you can with everything else, Sometimes the fix for lighting issues is adjusting your subject against the light or adjusting yourself to shoot from somewhere else versus stopping everything, changing lighting, coming back, and your subject's way moved on. So that's one thing that that trick does here. And, um, and so I've got the smile coming in. She's laughing. I realize I want to change this composition. I want to change the shot, right? These are all vertical. And I think, you know, I want to go closer into her. And so I, I step forward a little bit more and I'm able to get this. Um, just, she's fully engaged. She's so cute. Um, we got the great uh, look in her eye, that brightness in her eyes, that, that beauty dish coming through, um, that, that little just soft wind pulling her hair back a little bit. She's got the hands exactly where I was hoping we'd get to and we didn't start with that. 
Um, and it's just such a sweet, sweet shot. That's, that's kind of the thing I'm wanting to get. Okay, that was a lot. Uh, I know, again, I could go on and on and I do in 200 and whatever pages, pages, I'm holding the book right now, 270 pages. Um, but hopefully that gives you a good overview of what you would expect to see um, when you're reading the book. I'm gonna take it back and see, uh, earlier I'd mentioned about questions. Um, you know, if you have questions about the gear, if you have questions about uh, lighting, if you have questions about these little tweaks I'm talking about in terms of posing, um, anything like that, feel free to ask and I'm happy to answer. Hey Tamara, so we do have a couple questions ready to go for you. Um, yeah, I should probably okay. stop there, huh? Oh, uh, if you have more slides, go ahead and keep going. I Sorry, I thought you came to Oh, a, no, no. Okay. No, no, I do. I'm done. I just wasn't sure. I should probably stop my share. Uh, screen cool. share, yes? Yes. Let's see you again. Okay. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> so if you have a couple questions I can get started with. And then if anyone who's still watching still has questions, you know, go ahead and submit them and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Uh, so one of the questions was about uh, that image you showed um, on the sand with the sun behind them and it was the silhouette. Uh, they're asking... Uh, yes. It, any tips for silhouettes and reducing radiance and gradients that may come through? Yeah. Um, so, you know, when stu that kind of sort, that sort of silhouette, you know, a lot of silhouettes are done later um, in twilight, that sort of thing. This one, it was still a pretty bright sun, as you could see from that first shot in the sand. So in this case, you know, I really have to um, increase my shutter speed to be able to get that kind of darker, darker look. And um, I really have to uh, pay attention to the actual outline of my subjects. That, that's where the expressiveness comes through. A lot of people would put on um, a neutral density filter if it was really bright and they had to manage you know, an ISO or, and they had problems with that based on how bright or dark it is. So for me, um, so much of using, of course, just a lens hood that helps protect some of those issues, but also tilting the camera in a certain way changes the quality of the shot uh, quite a lot in my experience. So those are some things I would keep in mind about the, the most common thing I see go, you know, quote unquote wrong with silhouettes is not putting an emphasis on um, the actual silhouette and interaction with subjects just a pose by itself. Um, you actually have a lot of leeway when you're posing individuals where you can, you know, have them twist in super awkward ways that would look terrible front lit, <laughs> but in a silhouette can look really beautiful. Thanks. Uh, the next question we have is for portraits. Do you usually use single shots or a higher frame rate? So for most of the portraits you saw in this book, I'm using single shot. Um, I'm not using a uh, continuous or autofocus because I have, um, for a lot of these, I'm setting it up like I was talking through. So I have some time to be able to um, use the little joystick, lock in my focus and shoot. If I have kids you know, jumping on the beach, that one image where they're on the beach and the little boy's jumping time and time again, there I'm definitely gonna have a focus that's matching my subjects and as they're moving. In that case, I was shooting with an extended field of focus um, that, you know, higher f-stop number so that I could get more of the family in focus. And um, the, uh, the only time I'm using kind of um, just a rapid do whatever you want camera <laughs> is if I have, you know, um, just a lot of motion, kids racing across the, the field or something like that. That's where I'll just be like, go, go camera, you know better. Another question we have is, how do you sort down to the keepers for, out of hundreds of images and how many deliverables do you offer your clients? That's a good question. Um, so you could see all these before images I was talking about. None of those go to my clients. <laughs> um, none of those go to my clients. I'm, I'm picking what I think of as the best of images. I would say on um, a normal portrait shoot, I'm taking somewhere in the vicinity of about 500 shots and, um, and delivering about 60. Um, I don't have a set formula for exactly how many I take and about exactly how many I deliver, but that's kind of a rough guideline. And um, what that means then is if I have a shot that I just love, but I also love six or seven shots that are a lot like it, I'm going to be delivering one of them because I have found time and time again, my clients are just overwhelmed when I give them seven shots, they're kind of alike, and I 
say, here, you do the work. I couldn't, I couldn't decide. Uh, so I try to keep the images that I'm delivering to be kind of the one or a set that goes together versus just being a repetitive shot. I try to make those decisions ahead of time. And I find that the more I kind of tighten up that collection and, um, and I kind of control the amount of images I'm turning around to my uh, client, the more I'm going to have a better sale and a better interaction. And they're going to have a better experience. Absolutely. Does the beauty dish create the catch lights in the eyes? Yeah, the beauty dish as a modifier um, is aptly named. It's a very flattering light. It's really beautiful for portraits. Um, it uh, does a lot in terms of being able to kind of create that, that gorgeous bright eyed look. Um, that said, you can often get uh, really great catch lights by um, just having a couple sources of light that really kind of enhance shooting with a, a lighting modifier or a reflector or a fill that's closer to your subject are gonna give you those kind of bigger catch lights. Um, so uh, what I have found with the beauty dish in the studio, I've got the big heavy pro photo uh, beauty dish, but on location you can have the light pop-up one that you put on your strobe or one that can act very similarly on a flash. So those are nice ways to kind of take that capability with you on the road. Great. Um, last question and then we'll wrap up. Uh, are you using any of the oh S-series lenses with the mirrorless Nikons? Sorry, I just got so stunned by the time. I can't believe it's three o'clock. Please repeat the question. No problem. Um, are you using any of the S-series lenses with the mirrorless Nikons? Oh, absolutely. I mentioned that I use the 105 all the time and I'm using that via the adapter for the Z camera. So um, with the Z lenses, you know, the 24 Z, uh, 24 to 70 Z lens, the F4, I actually was fortunate enough to shoot the campaign for it in Mexico. It was like this, you know, week long campaign using that lens to show the capabilities of it. So I'm intimately familiar with just how much you can do with that lens. I have that one on a lot, um, but I'm adapting the 105, the 70 to 200, um, and sometimes the 24728 when I know that I want to get that depth of field uh, flawlessly. In my experience, it's been just seamless. I can use all my lenses. Great. Well, it looks like we don't have any more questions here, but I just want to thank you for joining us today and giving us this webinar. A lot of people did comment that they found it really helpful and it was really fun to watch. Great. Those some great pictures of the kids. And you can see more pictures like that in Tamara's book, which is available on our website, uh, rockynook.com. Amazon and anywhere else that books are sold, you will tomorrow receive an email with a link to watch the replay of this and also with that coupon code to buy Tamara's book on the Rocky Nook website for 40% off. So thank you so much, Tamara. I hope you have a good rest of your day. I know it's already three, so you don't have too much longer to go. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Everybody stay safe. Thanks for all the sweet comments. Yeah, thank you so much. And thanks everyone for joining us. Bye. Bye.